And it's a pleasure to have you because I don't think that you can disprove this. Life. I mean, life. And we've just had the rabbi on stage talking about what life is. The soul, the spirit of things. Life can't be artificial. Okay. Is it true? Well, let's start by defining artificial. Okay. What is artificial? Because uh, many people would argue that anything that you find on a planet obviously has to be part of nature, including everything that humans have created. So why do we say that one thing is artificial and the other one is natural? Let me give you an example. Um, <clears throat> if we build a house, that's artificial. If a bird builds a nest, we call that natural, right? We, is, it, yes. is, it, is it defined by man-made? So let me challenge it again. Uh, there's a well-known anti-inflammatory drug that was developed in the 1960s by a German chemist. Brand new molecule, millions of people take it. I would suppose you would consider that artificial, right? But yes, it's a product okay. of a laboratory. Okay. 20 years later, they figured out that you can find it in the trunk of some African tree. So, suddenly this compound that was artificial became natural. So if we find a bacteria that produces plastic, then all plastic bottles suddenly become natural. So that's a very difficult borderline, what you call artificial, and I would argue that let's talk about synthetic. Can life be synthetic? Okay, let's stick with yeah, synthetic. Yeah, okay, well okay. then, all right, let's go with that. So once we've <coughs> sort of gone into that, so can we make synthetic life? We would think that every creature on this planet was created by nature, and there was actually a huge debate about that until there was a gentleman called Craig Venter, who's a well-known scientist, and he and his team set out to create a new bacteria that has never existed before. And what they did is they did a lot of planning on their computer about creating this new, very simple bacteria. And then they built it up. Basically, they built a DNA, base pair by base pair, with the belief that if they put that together, it's actually going to work by itself. And it wasn't obvious, because we've never seen any organism that was not created by nature. We've messed around with organisms and changed them, but we've never created something new. And there was actually a big debate. A lot of religious people said that, no, that won't work, because there has to be a god or gods or some divine creature that gives it life. Guess what? It worked. So that was sort of the first artificial life. So that's my argument against what you say. That is, <sighs> that is a synthetic creature. And it's a synthetic creature that reproduces itself? Yes, it does. And it consumes? Yes, it feels fine. Yeah, yeah it feels yeah. fine. And yeah, it, it makes eats, decisions. It reproduces. And it uh, makes decisions, maybe But it not. turns left, it turns right. It's a bacteria, okay? So okay. it reproduces. It <laughs> doesn't do a lot more complex <laughs> things than it. Well, but I can go a little bit further before you take that off. All because right. uh, <laughs> if I was in your place, if I was in your place, I would actually bring up the argument that, still, that this is still made of the sim same building blocks as any other creature, because we're still using the same proteins as in other, as in other, other creatures, same enzymes. But we can take the argument a little bit further. There are researchers, so let's go back one step. So as, as far as we know, every living being on this planet is made up of the same building box, the same 20, I mean, you can go back grade nine biology, still okay? So we have 20 amino acids. And we have four different, let's call it codes in the DNA, letters, A, T, C, G. Mm -hmm. um, you, went to, you went to school in America, right? I'm yes, sure. I did. I'm not sure they teach that. that. Yep. So, <laughs> and, so, so we all... They do. They do. Okay, they so, do. Oh, sorry about a that. T. <laughs> and so every creature that we know is, uses the same four letter codes in the DNA and the same 20 amino acids. No, that's not true, because there are researchers who figure, like, ah, there aren't enough combinations. Let's do something more sexy. And they've created new genetic code. So they said, let's introduce more letters. So there are more combinations. And those letters can actually, and they can build it into the DNA, and they can actually code new amino acids. So now we actually have new DNA with new codes, that are, and they're building new amino acids into living creatures. And these are functioning living creatures. Now. Think about when they start planning multicell organisms. Multicell organisms later on, if our, if our understanding of biology is good enough, if our computers are sophisticated enough, let's say we create multicell creatures that have nervous systems, maybe intelligence. So with time, I leave that up to your imagination. Well, I mean, it sounds to me very European. It's like lots of words overcomplicated. But it's, I have to say, it's dispelled. I believe right. you. Life can't be artificial. Well, I do. I've heard about this bacteria. I know it was synthesized. I agree. The myth has been dispelled. Consider this myth 
burned. <coughs> However, you surely can't defeat this. We shouldn't interfere with nature. Okay. Yeah. We shouldn't corrupt it to begin with. Okay. This is the most environmentally friendly burning I I've ever seen. It like is. <coughs> it is. So, I mean, this is an easy one. I mean, you could have come up with something better. I mean, quite honestly, what do we do, what do we humans do, except for staring at the stars and dreaming? I mean, what do we actually, when, how any manifestation of human creativity interferes with nature? Anything we do, when we don't live in a cave, but we, you know, we build a house for ourselves, you know, we interfere with nature. And uh, to challenge that, you know, if we think of medicine, isn't medicine, by definition, interfering with nature? We're messing, medicine is old as humanity, whatever you called it. Aren't we messing with nature when we give somebody insulin uh, for the rest of their life so they don't buy, die from diabetes? Aren't we messing with nature? Well, I, think, I think from or, the health perspective. Let me give you a better example. Oh, okay. okay. So when we vaccinate a child, okay, and we don't let that poor little bacteria live, we don't let that poor little bacteria divide and grow a community, we kill them. Isn't that interference with nature? Yes. It is. Okay. It is interference with nature. But let's take, <laughs> but let's take this. If, but if we're assuming, because these diseases, they obviously grow with populations as well. They, they, they become things that they seem to answer the calls that are created over time. So we're also interfering with nature, not necessarily even through provocativism or even reactionary. We're developed, things are changing and evolving just simply because life is changing and evolving. What I think I would go for this is we shouldn't interfere with nature. If we're looking at this idea of, of the super baby, if we're looking at this idea of, of procreation from our standpoint, if we are really going to start to challenge this concept of the babies that we have already on our own are actually quite miraculous. The circumstances that we bring children into now, the health circumstances, the familial circumstances we bring them into now, by and large, is quite fantastic. And comparing it to what it was two and three and four hundred years ago, it's miraculous how much it's changed. And in fact, overpopulating is really the problem. It's not the quality of the babies that we're bringing as much as it's the fact that we're bringing them into circumstances that have already been so drastically interfered with that it's, pr it's driving this, this idea to try to perfect the baby. Okay, so let me get this straight. So what you're saying is, so in last century, we have doubled life expectancy, okay? So it's perfectly but okay. But based on birth death rates primarily, not, no, no, not no. length of life as much. It's, A little bit very, of length. very, very significantly also length of life. Yeah. Because birth, <clears throat> obviously childhood birth is one of them. But... A lot of other things, like we give people antibiotics, so you don't die. A hundred years ago, 80% of people died from infections. Today, we don't die from infections. So we don't, you know, most people don't die from their hypertension. You know, uh, um, a lot of places, two-thirds of kids are born with a seizures. You know, we, we interfere, and those are, these, so chemotherapy is okay, vaccination is okay, antibiotics are okay, all of the hypertension drugs, those are all okay, right? For now, me, they're fine. They're fine. Okay, so, <laughs> so when we give gene therapy to an adult, Mm -hmm. basically to make a blind man see or to cure their cancer. We have people walking around who are genetically modified already because let's say they got a cancer therapy treatment which involves changing their at least certain cells in their body. So genetically modifying an adult to fix a disease, that's still okay, right? But genetically, still, yeah, but genetically, okay. ge genetically modifying an embryo, that's no-no. That's a no-no. Oh, I go. Okay. That's a really good argument. So I... <laughs> no. Okay, okay. Well, what no, but what I'm saying is this. The supposition here is that a life itself... Now, people can be... I, what you're saying is that they are already <coughs> predisposed to cancer. They're already pre... I'm saying that the course of life has oftentimes brought these diseases on. And that these are... Cancer is obviously... A rel as far as we understand, it's a relatively new illness, right? I mean, relatively speaking. What? Cancer's been around for centuries, and, I mean, thousands of years. Yes. It's, yes? It's always been there, yes. It's always been cancer. Yes. And so, but it's just become new in certain creatures over time? I mean, no. It's always been there. It's the reason there are more cancer cases is because we live longer. You know, if you get eaten by the, when you're 18 by the lion, you actually don't have time to develop cancer. All right. So that's a right. that's <laughs> good argument. That's a good argument. <laughs> All right. We are interfering with nature all the time. You do make a fantastic argument. This myth is burned. But surely, and we'll come here to the, to the crux, 
well, this, I actually need treatment after this. Super babies are the distant future. Mm -hmm. So surely technology cannot be ready for this just yet. It, we keep talking about AI, the imminent future. It's right here upon us. And then we get people who are really on the precipice of all this saying, we're far, far away, actually. Mm -hmm. Super babies, they've got to be, I mean, that's got to be at least as complex. It's so interesting to think about it. If I walk off now, then you keep that on and you don't burn it. <laughs> well, there's, yes. a temp there's a temptation there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there <laughs> so so uh, what you can do is any of you can... Uh, Google for yourself designer babies, and you're going to get a Google AdWords ad, at least one, from a company offering, uh, this is an infertility clinic, which basically will offer you that you can choose the, I don't know, the gender of your child or the eye color of your child. This is an existing service today. So be th we, before we think, this is, you, you can go in and you can order this today. Whether I agree with it or not, that's a different, that's a different case. But I'd like to know, do you agree with it or not? I, I am not against designing babies because I think there are 10,000 different medical conditions that are connected in one way to the other genetics. I think the, the real question is, are we using this for therapeutic purposes, especially therapeutic purposes where it's a disease for which we don't have a reasonable alternative? Because I think that if we would make a vote here, we can try this, you know? Okay, yeah. so let's, start, let's see what the audience thinks about designer babies. So let's say there is an inherited disease in a family where there is a reasonable, a reasonable chance that the child who is born will have a horrible disease and will die in pain by the age of five. Okay, wait, who, wait, that was a really hard sell. Of course, you know, I'm trying to... That, that I'm was trying a to, really okay, I'm hard sell. I'm trying to yeah. go to the extreme. Yeah. Okay, so who believes it would be okay to do genetic modification on the embryo? See? Okay, yeah, let's because go, let's the go empathy step. level of the room is so no, ridiculously no, no, no. high. But that's not the way to look that, at it, because I'll show yeah. you what the difference is. But, but okay. can I ask this question? Because I yeah, think there's a more pervasive question yes. here, and I, and I would agree. With, I would have raised my hand to this. But let me ask You're this. supposed Who, to argue. I know that, but I mean, we're, but these are, we're, <laughs> we're really splitting hairs here. Who would actually agree with having a super baby if you thought, well... My mom kind of had a funny mustache, even as a young kid, and my dad's a bit predisposed to big feet and a tubby <laughs> belly at the age of 25. I wouldn't, and a little bit of baldness, I wouldn't mind getting rid of that. Who would have a super baby then? Shame on you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to, so the question is, the point I want to get to is this whole stuff is not new. So we have had uh, the first test tube baby, so <coughs> IVF Definitely. baby. Was Which born. is almost 41, right? Exactly. For, basically, it was born 40 years ago. Right. We have been able to do genetic modification for almost 50 years. So this is not, not something brand new. Why are we talking about it now? The reason we're talking about it is because our understanding of genetics is growing exponentially. And suddenly, we're, we're understanding you know, tens of thousands of traits that we can influence. And it's not only medical, but, it's, but a lot of it is behavioral and a lot of very sensitive issue related to sexuality, beliefs, stuff like that, which is a lot more tricky. And that's one part of it, so our understanding is better. The other is, until now, Genetic modification was a difficult task. You needed a huge lab, a lot of very well-trained scientists, millions of dollars, and years and years until you could make it happen. And a couple of years ago, they discovered a new technology called CRISPR-Cas9, which is a, a tool for gene editing that is so simple. I've seen 10-year-old kids doing this in biohacker labs in California. Which is frightening. That is frightening. Yeah. So I think this is why we need to talk about it, because mm -hmm. it's a matter of how easy the technology it is, to, it is used. So computers had been around for decades before people wrote the first computer virus, because computers were this big, huge mainframe thing at a university, which all the, only the researchers had access to, and there were punch cards you know, stuck into yeah. them. But suddenly, when everybody had a PC, now we have, depending on how you define the virus, we have hundreds or thousands or tens of millions of viruses because everybody has access to the technology. And you know, try banning or regulating computer viruses. Good luck. So what I'm talking about is right now, we're in a situation where it has become so easy. So right now, what used to cost a million dollars and years of research for a slight chance of success, today is something that you can do in a couple of weeks from a few thousand dollars on a kitchen table. 
And I think that regulatory bodies, to say the, the least, are not totally prepared to deal with this. This is why I think we have to talk about it now, because personally I think that curing disease, because right now the, the no-go point, as you say it, is modifying germline, meaning sperms or eggs. So adult gene modification is okay, but we could actually fix a lot of things in, in embryos, and they've done it. I mean, the first, uh, the first time they showed that this technology works in, in human embryos by, was by a Chinese group three years ago, and then last year there was a group in Oregon which actually succeeded fixing a mutation that was a, it was a disease related to a cardiac disease which caused sudden death at a later stage. They had a 72% success rate in fixing every single cell in the embryo without any kind of side effects. So this is a cheap, fast, very simple, and incredibly effective technology that's out there. And, and you know, about 50 countries in the world have regulated it, but most of the world, it's unregulated. And the problem is, when it's cheap, fast, and easy to do, it's very difficult to regulate. So it's going to happen. The question is, what do we do with it? And I think the real risk is that we don't deal with it and one day, what you're going to find is, you know, you have this kid that you insisted to have it naturally, you know, like the other ones, in yes, a natural way. Like you should. And when, <laughs> your teenage, when, the, when your kid becomes a teenager, they'll go to you and say, Dad, I know you had this natural idea, but, you know, all my classmates are better looking, smarter, faster than me. Why were you so cheap? Didn't you have a few thousand bucks to upgrade me a little bit? And that is a world that can easily happen in a few decades. Right, but that is a dystopia. I mean, we really said if we're racing to a very scary future, I mean, that is a, a potentially very shallow future, at least on the terms of what we value today. So I do have to say, I mean, I will burn this myth because it's absolutely preposterous to even think that super babies are the distant future because, as you mentioned, we're already making massive strides and creating a much, much greater physical quality and eliminating diseases, so it's clear this myth is burned. But I think that question still pervades, and I think we're very much aligned on this, is that fast, cheap, and out of control is stealing a title from an Errol Morris film is actually a really frightening way to look at many things because the changes become exponential, and the results are something that we actually don't necessarily know. And it's a bit of, you get, you be careful what you wish for, because the other results on the outside of that. So curing inheritable diseases and trying to make quality of life a much higher thing is fantastic. But really getting into just the vanities and appealing to the vanities of humanity is, is a different thing. Well, it depends on what you fix. So give an idea, almost all mammals can synthesize vitamin C. We have a defect. We can't, so we have to eat vitamin C. So what if we decided we're going to fix all humans and from now on we, we can synthesize vitamin C? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I don't think that you know, if we take out, we knock out the genes that cause certain cancers or increase the risk for cancers, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The problem comes when you're really what they call non-therapeutic genetic enhancement. When we say that we have those genes, well, I want the kid to be a... And this is complex because it's not one gene. It's a lot of different genes working together and a bunch of other things interfering. And so once people start ask, asking for that, you know, guess who is going to be available? The rich. Yeah. So suddenly you're going to have a society where the rich are able to afford, I'd like a little enhancement because I'd like them to be, you know, uh, really good photographic memory or a little bit better in math or a little bit, you know, diff different muscle buildup or have a little bit of more EPO so they can run faster. And then, you know, the rich kids will be genetically upgraded and the poor kids won't. And that would be a dystopian future yes. with a lot of social conflicts. All right. Well, we leave it here, ladies and gentlemen. A big round of applause. Erno Duba joined Thank us you. today. Fantastic. I really enjoyed that Thank with you. you. It's fantastic. Thanks so much. <laughs>